It's totally a pleasure to be here. It's a really, really big show right here. It's great to be back, man. <laughs> it's really exciting for me and an honor to be heard by so many people. Well, it looks like I get to say I told you so that scientists figured out how to see and hear thoughts. Kamatani et al., the Japanese researchers, published photos showing images of shapes and letters captured from behind people's heads using functional magnetic resonance imaging. And all this is in the journal Neuron for December 10th, 2008. They show people letters and spell out the words neuron, then capture images of the letters from behind the person's head. It's free and on the web if you search for Neuron Journal or see my webpage, tedhuntington.com, and take a look at those MRI images of the word neuron. It's startling. In fact, one of the authors, Yukiyazu Kamatani, told me himself in an email that it may be possible to see what the eyes of any species see, but that even capturing images produced internally by the brain using MRI, in common terms, seeing thought seems very likely to be published in the near future. So that is fantastic, obviously. So, you know, you've seen these images. Can you accept now that people can at least see what our eyes see remotely using MRI? Kamatani said that he would not deny the possibility of a future mass market of consumer cameras that can see what the eyes of people and their pets see, but that big advances in MRI or other technology would be necessary for that to happen. You know, so it seems clear that next to be published soon are pictures of images produced internally by the brain. For example, think of a green square in your mind, and then MRI captures an image of that square and maybe images of the letters in the word neuron that people just think of. You know, Kamatani stated that seeing these internally generated thought images is a possibility because seeing external objects and internal images should share some common neural processes. So, you know, we might be able to see the images produced by our brain and to send these images to each other someday. Or possibly the next publication will be how they remotely record the sounds that people hear, maybe by shouting in somebody's ear and seeing if the MRI registers a signal. You know the Japanese are famous for shouting in people's ears, right? And, and from there, maybe they will be able to decode sounds produced internally by the brain, like songs we hum in our mind, internal sounds, you know, to basically hear thoughts. Kamatani told me, believe it or not, that they have already been able to distinguish between different syllables, such as po versus go. It's amazing that this is happening in our lifetime and that we may soon enjoy the incredible benefits of hearing thought. I mean, wouldn't that be wonderful to be able to hear each other's thoughts? You know, the next obvious question is, can you send images back to the brain that will show up in front of their eyes? For example, can they beam the text neuron onto the visual cortex of the brain to make the letters appear to be floating out in front of our eyes, you know, overlaid over what we normally see? Uh, that might be useful in the entertainment industry, for example. You could have text beamed in front of your eyes without needing to look at a teleprompter, and you could see, mo you know, could see movies in front of your eyes without needing any kind of television or display device, just beamed directly to your brain and appearing just out in the space in front of your eyes, right? Or maybe you could, uh, they could send a picture of the uh, word neuron to appear on the screen just in our mind, for example, where we visualize a picture of a sandwich or something, right? I mean, could it... Could it be possible to send the letters of the word neuron to the, that internal screen so that we just see the word neuron in our mind but not in front of our eyes? You, you know, think of the possibility of not only sending images and sounds directly to a person's brain, but also being able to remotely move a person's muscles. You know, wouldn't that be an interesting product of this science? Because there's a simple unifying principle that if you can make a neuron fire, neurons are the cells in every nervous system, you can stimulate anything the neuron is connected to, whether that's a muscle, the images your eyes see, the sounds your brain hears, or smells, or tastes, or the sensation of touch. I mean, you could remotely make a person scratch an itch, although I have no idea why anybody would want to do that. Uh, and, you know, believe it or not, the idea of remotely mu moving muscles is a very old idea. In 1791, an Italian physician, Luigi Galvani, became famous because he used electricity to make a frog leg muscle move. Galvani simply put a scalpel on the frog leg nerve while an assistant produced a spark remotely by cranking on a static electricity machine. Each spark would make the frog leg muscle kick. For years, frog legs were used to measure the strength of electricity. So what Galvani did was direct neuron activation, directly touching the nerve, 
Uh, but imagine the possibility of remote neuron activation, where people could make a muscle move remotely, basically what Galvani did, but without having to touch the nerve with a scalpel, but using a particle beam instead. I mean, if, if you could make a muscle contract remotely, that opens the door to a lot of gruesome possibilities. You know, for example, you could stop a person from breathing by holding their lung muscles remotely, and nobody would be able to see this, because presumably the beam that does this would be invisible. You know, you could stop a heart muscle from beating and what would any coroners be able to say you know here's a perfectly healthy body we don't know how they died you know you could march people around by remotely moving their leg muscles you could change our voice muscles to say things we don't want to say but you know on a positive note you could freeze a violenter in the act of violence right uh, you know so can you can see the immense value of this kind of technical advance and not only sending images uh, of the word neuron back to appear in front of people's eyes and in their mind and sending sounds that sound like they come from the outside or that we hear directly in our mind, but to remotely move our muscles in a way that we absolutely have no control over. It's an important potential technology to examine. If people do figure out how to send images directly to the brain, people might one day be warned. Remember that the images and sounds in your mind might be from an external source and are not from any gods or even from your own brain, but instead are sent there by idiots in our government. You know, it's a legitimate science to be researching, and it's not a new idea. In 1911, Hugo Gernsbach wrote about a thought recorder. In 1937, André Marois uh, wrote The Thought Reading Machine about a professor who invents a machine that can hear thoughts. In 1958, there was a science fiction story called No, No, Not Rogove, in which Stalin wants scientists to make a beam that can remotely confuse people. And I was thinking, hey, you don't need a beam to remotely confuse people. Just send them Yanni's music. I'm joking. In the 1967 movie, The President's Analyst, the phone company invents a method to call people through thought. I mean, imagine if the phone company recorded every phone call ever made in their wires. It would make the Library of Congress look small. If a group of people did figure out how to see and hear thought, they would have an enormous advantage over those who can't. You would never be surprised by a sneak attack if you could see and hear everybody's thoughts, and you could never and you could perform endless sneak attacks on those who couldn't see hear and couldn't see and hear thoughts because they would never see or hear it coming, right? Uh, but the health benefits would be amazing. The sooner this technology gets to the public, the sooner millions of lives might be saved. You know, the last time I was here, Fred implied that I have a mental disease, and I don't. But when millions follow a guy who's been dead for 2,000 years named Jesus or Muhammad, you know, delusion is common. We need to tolerate free thought, and the psychiatric system is scary. You know, anybody can be picked up off the street, locked in the hospital, no trial, held for life, tortured. But the psychiatric system will probably be made uh, consent only soon, I think. And, you know, I'm really into science and, and the future, I should explain, you know, where other people have sports, religion, and, and acting. Um, and this idea will blow your mind out there, that our descendants will colonize the planets of many suns, right, and form a globular cluster. It's a pattern that light particles form nebulae. Those clouds condense into spiral galaxies. Life in those spiral galaxies pulls their stars into globular clusters. These clusters unite to form a globular galaxy and then just move around the universe looking for more matter for fuel and food. Then there is this idea, that, let me explain, that all matter is made out of particles of light, um, which is simple, because when you light a match, you see particles of light exiting the match, and the burnt match gets smaller. So those light particles were in the match the entire time, and the same is true for a candle or a log. They're all made out of particles of light. And I reject the Big Bang Theory, because are we supposed to believe that 20 billion light years away, space just ends? You know, much more likely, space is infinite, and the background radiation is probably just light from the stars close enough to see. Um, and, but, you know, the future is stopping violence. The Earth is overrun with violent people. Violence is the biggest evil on Earth. And perhaps a registry of violent offenders and street cameras that the public can see, too, will greatly reduce violence. And the future will probably have less anti-sexuality. In this time, people pretend that they are not sexual and not aroused by the human body. It's a massive lie. Because the biological reality is that humans only survive because, our interest, because of our interest in sex and pleasure 
Only the horniest survive. If people do not like sex, women will not get pregnant and humans will go extinct. I mean, there's those who could, those who were too cold to have sex didn't reproduce. We are all the products of a horny woman and a horny man. But people are the biggest bunch of liars. None of them say publicly how they love breasts, penises, and butts, or how old they were when they started masturbating. It's total idiocy to curse the source of our life and pleasure. And the future is decriminalization of prostitution, I think, because people can take money to 